In today's video, we will continue going through the Metasploit code and rewrite it into a Python module. Rewriting something into another language may be time consuming and difficult. So I will walk you through and give you tips to make the process easier. To start of, we need to create the location of the module. Python needs to know that the folder is a module, so we will add a file called init.py. There is nothing inside you can just leave a blank. Then the actual code will lie on the same directory level. I will put the Metasploit code on the side so it will be easy for you to follow. First we want to do is mimic the methods. Let's create them with similar name but make them private. Private functions are created with double underscore which prevent them from being accessed outside the scope of what they intend to be. In this case, we want them to be only accessible inside the module. This is a good way of protecting them from accidental misuse. But in order for the exploit script to use this module, we will create a function that can be called from the exploit. Let's name that run, which will return the encrypt data private function. Okay, so we have our five functions. The parameters are also the same for Metasploit. Only difference is that they are private, but we have a small bootstrap function at the end. Let's now put code inside the function starting from encrypt data. This function receives the plain text password and public key. But there is a condition that checks whether both of them are strings. In Python, we can easily use this instance function to check whether an object is a string or not. Then we can raise an assertion error if it encountered a non-string object. Next will be the exponent. If you remember from the last video, one of the requirements for encrypting a data using RSA is the exponent. And typical exponent value is 65,537. As I mentioned also on the last part of the previous video, all values will be converted into hex representation. That's why it became like this. Next is there is an empty Ruby array called E. We can translate this into Python by using an empty list. This will contain the characters of the encrypted password. Next, Ruby code is forcing a text to be encoded in UTF-8. I didn't see any alternative way of doing this in Python, so I will just assign the text as the value. If you know a proper way of doing this, let me know in the comments below. Then next will be just passing the UTF-8 plain text password to another function. To summarize what this three line of code is doing, First, it prepares the variable that will hold the encrypted password. It makes sure the plain text password is in UTF-8. That's because UTF-8 is the most common encoding scheme and has several advantages. Then it passes the plain text password to a function. We still don't know what this function is doing, but based from the name, we can guess that it is checking some limits. The next lines of code is fairly simple. It loops through each character of the plain text password. Then it passes each of them to the RSA function. From what I researched in the web RSA is somewhat a block cipher also. So it might mean here that each character represents each block. Last step will be to push the ciphertext to the Ruby array. Let's initialize C. Then do a while loop until we reach the max length of the plain text password. There is a min function in Python which do similar thing with Ruby, so we can easily use that. Then we can just simply slice through the Python list and get our desired item. And pass it to the private function together with the modulus and exponent. Last will be to append the result and increment our counter. Before we go further, did you notice something strange? How about now? If not, pause the video and analyze. Notice the parameters passed to the RSA encrypt function. Our formula for encrypting a data is to raise the plain text to the exponent, then perform modulo division against the modulus. But we don't have the modulus here. Mathematically speaking, the public key consists of two parts, which will be the modulus and exponent. So in our case, this means that the public key we saw from the login form is not the whole public key. But in fact, it is just a part of it, to be more exact. It is the modulus. This is something to keep in mind when performing crypto analysis in scenarios like this. Sometimes the variable naming can be confusing. To finish the function, the Ruby code combines all item in the array. In Ruby, there is no return statement. It will just spit out the output of whatever last statement is included in the function. This is one of the major difference with Python. So in our Python code, we will just do same thing, but of course use the return keyword. Now that we are finished building the encrypt data function, let's proceed with the next. Probably it makes sense to try the max data size function. This function accepts a string. And same with previous one, it also performs checks if the argument is a valid string or not. 
then it passes the string to the two byte charge function. This is a ternary expression, which is an alternative way of writing if else condition. This is common in most programming languages and not only in Ruby. If it is a two byte character, we will return 58. Else, just return 116. Among the different functions in this code, this is one of the most confusing to me. Why would we return 58 if the character size is two bytes? Shouldn't it be 116 since we need more space? If you know the answer, let me know in the comments below. Let's start by using again is instance function to check for a proper string. We need to make slight adjustment here. The argument to the function is str, but we will use same name with his instance function. That will confuse the interpreter, so we need to change the variable of the argument to something different. Next is to perform a ternary operation, but in Python format. Now that we are finished with the max data size function, why don't we continue down the chain by building the two byte charge function? So what is this two byte charge function? From the function name, we can easily have an idea on what it is intended to do, which is to check whether a character occupies two byte of memory space. But what is this expression? And what is a code point? A code point is the integer representation of the characters we see on the screen. These graphical elements are also called glyphs. Both Ruby and Python has their own ways of getting the code point of a glyph. Not all glyphs are the same. Some occupies one byte of memory space, some need two bytes. In order to determine if a glyph occupies one or two byte, we will perform bit shifting technique. For example, we have a glyph here whose code point is 97, which is exactly eight bits. If we try to shift the bits to the right by eight, all of them will be dropped and we will have nothing left. But if we have a glyph like this, shifting it by eight bits on the right will still give us two remaining bits. This is how this code is doing it. It first gets the code point in decimal. Then internally, it shifts the bits to the right by eight. Anything that returns a value greater than zero, meaning there are still bits left, is a two byte character. Else it just occupies one byte. Now let's go to our Python code. Let's perform check for a valid string. Then we will perform a loop. And use another ternary expression that will return true if bit shifting operation resulted to a value greater than zero, or it will return false otherwise. We have two functions left. Among them, the padding function is more complicated, so let's leave it for last. Since the last video, we have been discussing the formula for RSA encryption, so you should be familiar with it already. We need the modulus, exponent, and plain text. But converting them into code is not straightforward as there are different things we need to consider. So let's analyze one by one how RSA encryption is represented in code. The modulus in the login form is in hex. Although we represent this as hex in other parts of the application, in this method we will need to convert it into base 10 or decimal equivalent. To do that in Ruby, we use to I method specifying the base of the original number. Same thing we need to do with the exponent. Remember, this is specified in the other part of the module as base 16. Like any crypto algorithm, RSA also follows rules in encrypting a data. One of them is the PKCS1 standard. One of the requirements is before encrypting the data, convert it first into fixed length hex representation. So if we have a password, regardless of what length, it will be padded into something like this. Then it will be further converted into this. We will deep dive on this conversion process when we go to the padding function, which will be the last part of this video. So in summary, that is the purpose of this padding function. It accepts the plain text password, then another parameter, which is derived from a series of operations, including bit shifting. This second parameter is equivalent to 128. That means the resulting value will be 128 bytes in length. After it gets the padded value, it will now perform the RSA encryption using the modulus and exponent. Then it will convert it to hex representation opposite of what the first two lines are doing. And we will return that to the caller if the length is even. Thus, we will pad one last time with zero. Let's convert first the modulus and exponent to base 10 or decimal. We can easily do that in Python using a function. We just need to specify the source base, which is 16. After that, we will create our padded as big int variable, which is a result of the pkcs1 pad2 function. Nothing interesting on this part is the format is almost the same as the Ruby counterpart. Just do note of the function names that are changing between Ruby and Python. 
Then next is to perform the actual encryption and store the result in a variable as well. We need to do some modification here to mimic what we will get from the Ruby code. We need to convert it back to hex. Remove the leading 0x. Then make everything uppercased. Then last will be a ternary expression, but in Python format. This will return the value if it's even, otherwise it will prepend a zero first before returning. Finally, we are now down to the final method, which is the PKCS1 padding. As I mentioned in the previous section, the whole purpose of this code is to turn your password into a fixed length hex representation. So let's discuss the logic. It accepts the plain text password and a number. The number is the 128 value we got from the calculation in the previous section. That is the size in bytes of the resulting padded value. First two lines are the same usual type checking mechanism. But in this case, we also have a check for the number argument. The next block of code is used to check whether the plain text password is too long. It must fit under the 128 byte limit. I believe this rule also came from the PKCS1 standard, but I didn't really dig in too deep on the specification. If you have more insights about this, feel free to comment down below. Next step is to initialize an array with 128 items whose values are zero. Ruby uses arrays instead of lists, which is another difference from Python. Then we decrement that limit by one to make it 127, which will be used to specify the plain text password length and put it on the last element of the array. Similar with Python, Ruby array item index start from zero. That's why we need to decrement one from 128 to make 127 as the last value. Then we will create a counter that is equal to the last index of the array, which is again 127. The counter in n is critical for the next operation. The next block of code will loop through the characters in the plain text password. This will get the code points in decimal and store it to the array we initialized on the upper part of the code. It will perform this operation while these conditions are still satisfied. In order to get the code point, in Ruby we can use ORD method. Then we will decrement i by 1 as a signal that we are done processing the first item we want, which is the last character in the password. After that, we will get the value returned by bytes per char function. In most cases, this will always be one byte since most password contains UTF-8 glyphs. It is very rare that we will have a password containing a glyph like this, which will occupy two bytes. There is also another while loop, which will run if the number of bytes per character is greater than zero. This means this block is guaranteed to run on every character of the password since each is at least one byte long. And there is another weird expression. This is a technique to get the least significant bytes of a code point. For example, if you have a two byte glyph, the most significant bytes will be the group of bits on the left half, while the least will be the group on the right. If we want to get the LSB, we can perform modulo operation to extract that part. You might be asking why the divisor is hex 100. That value is equal to 256 in decimal. Since a byte can only hold numbers up to 256, performing modular division against that value will extract the group of eight bits on the left side. So this variable also refers to the least significant bytes of the code point. Once the LSB is extracted and stored, it will perform another 8-bit shift to the right. This will move the MSB to the right and drop the LSB. N will again be decremented by 1. And the LSB will now be stored to the array on the next available index from the end. The number of bytes will be decremented by 1 to signal that we are done processing this particular group of bits. This process will repeat until all code points are stored inside the array. Once we captured our code points, we will fill the rest of the items with random bytes or zero. Then we will perform several conversions to arrive at the final value. Pack the array into binary sequence using 8-bit unsigned char format. Convert that into hex with high nibble first. Then convert the hex into base 10 or decimal. So the padded password would look like this in the end. From plain text password, it will be stored in an array. Then we will perform several conversions to arrive at this very long decimal value. Now let's quickly construct the equivalent Python code. First will be the type checkings. We will check if the password is a valid string. And check if the variable n is a valid integer. We will then determine whether the character occupies one or two bytes. Another check if the plain text password is too long or not. It should be less than 128 bytes since that is the capacity of our array. 
Since we are now in Python, we will mimic the array as a list with 128 items whose initial values are zeros. We can easily use a list comprehension to do that. We will store the password length on the last item of that list. Then we will perform the internal loop that will get each code points and store it in the list. In Python, we can also use ORD function to get the code point of a glyph. Then get the number of bytes per character. And another loop to get the least significant bytes of the code point. Do a right shift by eight bits to get the most significant bytes. Store the code point inside the list. Sorry my recording crashed, so I need to continue again from this part. Let's do more padding. Then another loop to pad again, but this time with random bytes. Finally, the last set of padding. Then we will mimic the final conversion steps. First is packing the list into an 8-bit unsigned char format. Then convert each item into hex. And finally, convert the whole value into decimal. We can now return that value to the caller. Our Python module is now complete. In summary, it starts with this function which accepts two parameters. One is the plain text password. Another is the modulus. Then from inside, it passes it to another function which performs the actual RSA encryption. From there, we transform the plain text password into a fixed length integer before doing the actual encryption. There are helper functions that is crucial in the encryption process, such as the padding function, and to check whether the glyph occupies one or two byte of memory space. We already tested this working on our previous video, so I will leave it up to you to play around. I will publish the script soon, so stay tuned on my community post. I hope you learned something valuable today. Converting something like this seems difficult, but you gain several advantages. First, you are able to understand and read others' code even without help from the original author. You improve your knowledge with cryptography, which is an important aspect of cybersecurity. And you gain edge over other ethical hackers by being able to develop tools and programs like this. If you find this video helpful, please support my channel by giving it a like. Please also subscribe if you want more ethical hacking videos. See you on the next one.